when he saw the city wholly given in idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and, the market da- <clears throat> and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Iconians of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this blab- babbler say? Others, some, he seems to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him, brought him unto Erbacus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof th- thou speakest is? And thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the, Athe- all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are of the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone or graven by art and man's devices, and the times of his ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed among and believed among the which was Dionysus the Arpargite, and the woman named Demaris, and the others with them. You may be seated. It's good to be with you here this morning. I want to reiterate what Dad said this morning about uh, our gratitude to you for your support. Uh, at Trauger, we, we definitely feel it. So the uh, passage that John just read for us um, gives us a speech that Paul gave on Mars Hill. And uh, it's quite possible that this is um, a shorter version or a summary of a longer speech uh, that, that Paul gave there. Um, and it captures very well Paul's push to reveal who the true God is to these who had never heard it before. As I, as I look at Paul and his writings, uh, I see three main emphases, three main categories or themes that, that Paul brings out throughout, um, throughout his writings. And I, I frame them here as three questions. They are, who is the true God? Secondly, who are the people of God? And thirdly, what is God's future or purpose? This morning, we're going to be looking at the first one. We don't have time to get into the rest uh, this morning. Um, so we're, we're going to be looking at who God is. My title, the title for my sermon this morning is, Who is God? Now, there's no way to cover the entirety of that subject here this morning. So we're going to skim over the basics, and we're going to present it from Acts 17 and what Paul is, is saying here to these, um, to these people. And then after that, we're going to look at how we can get to know him better and more intimately. The key point that I want to bring across this morning is that knowing God and developing a deep desire to learn to know him better is central to understanding who we are and what we're doing here. 
Knowing God and developing a deep desire to learn to know him better is central to understanding who we are and what we're doing here. So we won't ever actually be able to know everything about who God is. But we can keep learning. And, and that process and activity of discovering or trying to discover who God is molds us into the people of God. We become a people with understanding, a people with vision, with purpose, dedicated to his work and to his kingdom. I'd like to read a story here, uh, adapted from the writings of Diogenes Laertius. Uh, he was a man, uh, a Greek man, who lived uh, around A.D. 200. Um, and this story is something that happened, uh, it was probably passed down orally to, uh, through many people to him. Uh, you can find an embellished version of this story in Don Richardson's book, uh, Eternity in Their Hearts. The year was 596 B.C., in the land of Israel, Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian forces were finishing up their final siege of Jerusalem, after which they plundered and burned the temple to the ground. Israel went into exile as a punishment for their wickedness. Across the Mediterranean Sea in the city of Athens, a disease or pestilence was ravaging the people. After trying to beseech their many gods for aid, the leaders of the town sent to the Pythian princess, also known as the Oracle of Delphi, a person who was uh, known in their world to have insight into the world of the gods. On the, and uh, they were located on the Isle of Crete. So they sent to um, this Oracle of Delphi to find out what was wrong. What should they do? The oracle instructed them that in addition to their many, many gods, and Athens was known as, as a city of, of many gods, there was still another god that they were missing. Uh, another god that was displeased with them. The oracle didn't even know the name of this god, only that he was displeased with the people of Athens and that they needed to purify their city. While the leaders of Athens were grateful for this information, they didn't know how to go about appeasing a god they didn't know. So they sent for a wise man, a poet or a prophet, from Crete by the name of Epimenides. And according to a passage in, in Plato's writings, Plato pays a tribute to Epimenides as that inspired man and credits him with helping mankind rediscover inventions lost during the Great Flood. So when Epimenides arrived, he instructed the people of, of Athens to send a herd of sheep out on a hillside. Uh, that hillside was called Areopagus. Now, if you, t if you break that word down, it's Ari, which refers to their god, god of war, Ares, and Pagus, which is rock. Um, and so they're looking at Ares rock. Um, the, the god Ares was also known as god Mars. And so if you, if you take that, um, translate that out, you get Mars Hill. And so that's where uh, Paul is speaking here as well. So now whenever a sheep laid down, they marked the spot, and they erected an altar with no name on it, because they didn't know the, uh, the God's name, and they sacrificed the sheep to this unknown God. In this way, the plague was stayed. Diogenes Laertius goes on to affirm that even in his day, which remember was AD 200, there were still some of these altars with no name inscribed upon them. But, you know, in reality, that shouldn't surprise us, because um, from what we read this morning, Paul witnessed one of those altars as well. So the question that the people of Athens and that Epimenides faced is, who is God? That's, it boils down to that question, who is God? They had many gods, and yet they discovered that there was yet another God that they did not know who was displeased with them, a God outside their realm of knowledge. So they sent for a man who they hoped would help them, to reveal, or that would hopefully reveal this God to them. And Epimenides was not able to reveal much about this God besides the fact that whoever he is, worship him. About 600 years later, God would send someone to reveal who that God is to the people of Athens. And while we don't know for certain, the story of Epimenides and the plague in Athens could very likely be the reason that Paul was inspired to preach his Mars Hill sermon in Acts 17. Before we dig into the verses, looking at, the, at who is God, we need to look at the audience, uh, because the audience can determine uh, the message very, um, very clearly. And there's 
uh, two specific groups that are mentioned here in verse 18. And the philosophies that they espoused or that they believed are actually familiar to us today, in extremes perhaps. And we would do well to remember that when we see them in our world today, they're not new. They've been around. Paul addressed them. As we look at these philosophies, these ways of thinking, we're going to ask ourselves three questions. We're going to ask them three questions. Who is God? What is real to them? And what is a good life? And then we're going to come back and we're going to ask ourselves the same questions. So the first group are the Epicureans. Their philosophy, their way of thinking comes from a man by the name of Epicurus, who lived around 300 BC. When we ask them the question, who is God, we get a very deist response. Now, a deist is someone who believes that if there is a God, first of all, that he is remote, and there may be multiple gods, but they're distant, they're separate, they're detached from who we are and what we're doing here. They may have created the world but they aren't interested in, in humanity and the world. That's what they think of when they think of God. When we ask them the question, what is the good life? They would say pleasure. Pleasure is the greatest good. Now, I do have to make sure that I give them credit um, because it's not the kind of pleasure or the kind of hedonism, the kind of just mad dash after pleasure that we see sometimes in the world around us. Now, I believe that is an, ex- uh, an extension or a continuation, an extreme of what they thought then. But it was still pleasure is the greatest good. Now, they felt that mental pleasure was better than physical pleasure. They believed that pleasure was defined as the absence of pain and fear. They also believe that something that brings pleasure in the moment but has poor or painful consequences later is not true pleasure. So uh, something that may bring about an addiction is not true pleasure, even though it may seem that way. They believe that to attain true pleasure, you are to live modestly, gain knowledge of the world, and limit one's desires or or, uh, have self-control. So like I said, this desire for pleasure is a far cry from what we see around us. Um, In fact, some of of this uh, desire for pleasure... um, may reflect some of our, our Christian views as well, and I'll get to that in a bit. What is real? They believe that matter was real, what you can feel, what you can touch. They called it materialism. Now, we, we hear materialism today, and, and we think of something slightly different. Um, when we think of materialism, we, we think about trying to amass as much as you can, trying to get what you can. And I do believe that th- that that is an extension of the Epicurean thought. It, it does eventually go to that extreme, or can go to that extreme. And sometimes we too are like these Epicureans, trying to amass as much as we can for ourselves. Like I said, a direct result of that philosophy of materialism. Now, throughout history, we see uh, the Epicurean thought continue on. We see, um, like I mentioned, if God exists, he is distant. He set it in motion and let it go. Some Christians throughout history have given the impression that God only occasionally shows up to do miracles. And that, I believe, encourages the thought that he is distant, that he is separated from us. You know, once we push God out of the picture, once, once we separate ourselves from him, it doesn't take long for many other dangers, things like evolution, to come uh, in, to be necessary for thought. Some of our founding fathers would have been um, new Epicureans, men like uh, Thomas Jefferson and Madison Franklin. You know, if you think about it, the idea of that a that there's a perfect place of pleasure without pain and without fear, that kind of corresponds to how we think about the Garden of Eden, right? It sounds like um, that's what they're talking about, and even our eternal reward. So there are parts of their thought that they were close. They had almost right. So let's go on to the Stoics. They get their philosophy from a man named Zeno, 
and they believed, I'm going to go in a different order here, what is the good life? They believe that the good life is one in which you do not show emotion. You may have emotion, just don't show it. Um, enduring pain and hardship without complaint. Um, perhaps a, a very military approach um, to life. Emotions resulted in errors in judgment. If you had emotions, they would cause you to make errors in judgment. They attempted to develop self-control and fortitude to overcome or at least, at least hide their emotions. To them, what is real? Logic and knowledge. The purpose of knowledge, ultimately, was so that you would do good. Virtue was based on knowledge that is gained through logic. You can reason your way um, to that virtue. And virtue is defined as maintaining a will that is in accord with something they call divine reason or fate. Um, I think there's an interesting parallel here that I'll co come back to in a little bit, but you know, we too define virtue as having a will in accordance with something greater than ourselves. Now, we, we point to the one true God for that. But they were close. They also believed that becoming a clear and unbiased thinker would allow them to understand that divine reason. Now, the word that they used for divine reason in the Greek is the word logos. And if you read in John 1... That word logos is used by John, and we have it translated as the word. In the beginning was the logos. So we have John taking the language that, that these Stoics used and shaping that around Jesus Christ. It's an interesting approach. So to them, who is God? God was the soul of the world, and it indwelt all things. That was what they would have said. Uh, it's a short step away from pantheism. They would, you could also argue that, that divine reason occupied the place of God as well. Um, that, that would, that would uh, work as well. So how are we influenced by Stoics today or throughout uh, recent history? We are taught that we have the power in our inner self to control how we feel and how we act. We have the power to choose whether to be happy, whether to choose to be strong. That's, that's a stoic approach to life. Don't let emotions control us. In some eras, emotions have even been frowned upon. Christianity may even be part stoic. Um, I found a quote that somebody said, thinking about religion in the early first century, uh, sorry, first millennium, meant thinking like a Stoic. So there are parts about Stoicism and Christianity that do go hand in hand. Um, one of the first ones is the human brotherhood. They believe that all humans were one brotherhood. And as, as Christians, um, they came to hold that as well. And we'll see that here in the passage in Acts. Uh, Paul brings that out, that we are brothers all humanity. There's not one that is on a higher level. They believe that we should moderate and master our basic urges rather than giving in to them. That's the definition of temptation. We're supposed to moderate and master our basic urges rather than giving in to them. And they, all, and they also believe that all humans will fail at that mission at some point, and that's sin. And we, we also recognize that. And like I mentioned earlier, it's, it is the philosophy of, that is used throughout the military of enduring pain and hardship while adopting large amounts of self-control. It's, um, it's not about pleasure, like the Epicureans said. It's about self-control. So these philosophies, the Epicureans, the Stoics, they were able to attain some level of truth even if they were just scraps. And even today, we have people who take these philosophies and they go in the wrong direction. They go to destructive ends. And I think that could be said for, for people within the church, within Christianity as well. So who is God? Let's take a look at the passage in Acts 17. How does Paul present God? 
Looking at verses 18 to 20, we see that these, these men, these philosophers, had an interest in the strange or the foreign gods, a new doctrine that they were hearing uh, associated with Paul. Now, you have to remember that 500 years earlier than this, Socrates also had or was accused of having or presenting foreign gods, and he was made to drink hemlock. So we see that Paul may be on the verge here of something that, that, he, that uh, he doesn't really want to get into. Um, but he does bring it very clearly to them. Now remember, Paul considers it of the utmost importance that all Gentiles know who the true God is. So when he is given an opportunity to speak to the philosophers at Ath- in Athens, he presents the gospel with an overwhelming emphasis on who this God is. He uses that altar to the unknown God as a window through which to show them the true God. Looking at verses 24 and 25, let me just read that. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He is creator. That is, the key, that is one of the key points that Paul wants to bring out here. He is the creator. He is not just a part of the world, as the Stoics would have claimed. He is the creator. Beyond that, he is, notice the present, present tense there, he is Lord of heaven and earth, and he is involved and sustaining. He is continually involved. He's not limited to dwelling in temples or in structures made by, men, made by men, and he gives to all life and breath and all things. He's actively involved, every breath in this world. Sustaining all life, not separate or distant or detached from the world, as the Epicureans would have claimed. In verse 26, he made of one blood all nations of men. And there we come to the the human brotherhood. The Stoics were, were some of the first to claim that brotherhood of all men. And they would say that all men come from nature or fate or that divine reason. Paul once again points to the creator, the creator God as supreme. Verse 27, that, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. He is a God that deserves to be, I'm sorry, a God that desires to be and a God that deserves to be sought after, that they should seek the Lord. It gives the idea of groping in the dark, trying to find that God. The word feel there, feel after him and find him, is translated handle in uh, Luke 24. Um, it's, it's the same Greek word. Luke 24 is, is uh, when, after Jesus had rose from the dead and he was presenting himself um, to his followers, he said, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. It's the same word there. It's physical. Feel me. He is truly present, and he's not out of reach. He's not separate or distant, as the Epicureans would have said. Verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being. In him we exist. He is our existence. Through him we exist. This quote and if you question whether Paul knew about Epimenides, this quote is actually attributed to Epimenides. Um, some of his writings, they say that this was something that he had said. So we see Paul bringing that out and uh, showing the philosophers that, yes, I know what I'm talking about. I've, 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 I know these things. The quote then at the end, for we are also his offspring, is another quote from Greek writers, um, Aratus and possibly also Cleanthes. Now, both of them were referring to their Greek god, Zeus, but they were saying, we are sons of God. And Paul uses that to say, yes, we are sons of God. Sons of the one true God. In verse 29, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. He, like us, is a living being. He's creator, He's sustainer. He's a living being. 
At the end, uh, man's device is something I want to bring out here. Device in the Greek means, or this tr translation, device means thinking or thoughts. And that's how it's translated the other three times it appears. These gods and philosophies, Paul is saying to them, these gods and philosophies that you've thought up, they don't come close to capturing the kind of living and powerful God. Verse 30. Times of this ignorance God winked at. God has ignored their ignorance for a time, but the truth has now been revealed. The light has come and it will shine upon the dark places of their understanding. The ignorance of Epimenides and those Athenians, God winked at. But now the truth has come and they must repent. That repent is the word that Jesus and John used. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Many times we associate that with, with confession, with sin, with doing wrong. And yes, it does fit with that. But the word actually means to change one's mind. It's about thinking. Of course, eventually that means a change in how we live, but it does start with a new way of thinking, a new philosophy, if you will. Repent. To the Epicureans and the Stoics, this would mean adopting new aims. It would mean adopting a new purpose. It would mean reconsidering what they thought was real and what they thought was the good life. And then in verse 31, Paul enters a portion of his message that was sure to go against any philosophies that they had. Final judgment. Judgment by a man who had been resurrected. And their response, some mocked, some said, let's hear some more. A oh, little interest. And then a few believed. So let's summarize. Who is God? I believe what Paul is bringing out here is a twofold aspect, or possibly threefold. Creational and covenantal monotheism. Now, monotheism is a big word that just means one God. One true God. Creational and covenantal. He is creational because he is creator, and he is involved in our lives daily, sustaining us. It's not he didn't just create us and then walk away. He is involved. And covenantal, he is near, he desires to be, and he deserves to be sought after. He is living and powerful, and he is calling us to repent and constantly tune our minds, tune our wills to him. If this is our God, if he is truly creational and covenantal, and if we say we know and believe this, we will live in a way that demonstrates that we believe it. And that means living in obedience. Living in obedience and living in imitation of Jesus Christ. We will conform our idea of what a good life is and what is truly real to mirror our belief of who God is. Remember I said at the beginning, knowing God and developing a deep desire to learn to know him better is central to understanding who we are and what we're doing here. So then, what is real? Yes, what we see around us is real. The physical, it's matter, it's real. But that which is in the heart is what truly makes a difference. If we truly believe what I said about God, about who he is, when we are asked what is real, we will say with our mouths and we will say with our thoughts, and we will say with our lives that the kingdom of God and those things that contribute to and, and those things that build the kingdom, that's what's real. Whether that's something like matter or whether that's something that's not. Is the good life about making sure we are living comfortably? Is it looking out for number one for ourselves? Is it only doing what we feel like doing? Doing what brings us pleasure? Is the good life having what everyone else has? If we truly believe in this God, when we are asked what is the good life, we will say with our mouths and our thoughts and our lives 
that a life in kingdom servanthood, a life serving God and others, is a good life, is the good life. So if we believe that, we will spend our life constantly tuning our minds and our wills, through our minds, constantly tuning our lives to bring us closer to God. Belief and repentance must not stop with our talk. It must transform our minds, and then our lives will be changed. Because if you truly believe something out of a repentant or a transformed, a turned-around mind, you will live it out. Romans 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mark twelve thirty, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Philippians 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We can use our minds to get closer to God. As we think and learn and discover, as we gain a deeper understanding and knowledge of God, we will begin, we will begin to develop a deeper relationship with him. That's how any relationship works. As we begin to search for him, we will be surprised at how close and accessible he is. As Paul says, though he be not far from every one of us. God has revealed so much more to us than he did to Epimenides. So much more than the people of Athens received. We can know God. You know, if we don't know who God is, how are we going to worship him? How are we going to pray to him? How are we going to serve him? Keep, seek, keep seeking to know him more. It's a challenge that I have, a challenge that I want to extend to you. You know, there's a third way to look at the world, a third way to approach this God in Acts 17. We talked about the Epicureans, and we talked about the Stoics, but if you go a few verses back in Acts 17 and look at verse, verses 11 and 12, I'm just going to read that. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether the, those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men, not a few. If you go back one more verse, you see that these were the people of Berea. These were the Bereans. With readiness of mind, they searched the scriptures daily. They were seekers. They were Nathaniels. You know, not all Greeks, not, a, not all Greeks missed Christ when he came. They didn't all miss the message. You know, we see in John 12 that there were certain Greeks who came to find Jesus. And they came to Philip. And they said, sir, we would see Jesus. Seeking Jesus. Listening to his word, his message with readiness of mind. So I talked about the Epicureans. I talked about the Stoics, their beliefs, their philosophies. But what about you? Do you know what you believe? Who is God to you? What is real? What is a good life? What kind of audience would you be? Do you have the readiness of mind that the Bereans had? Or their zeal for searching the scriptures? Do you endeavor to see Jesus? Knowing God and developing a deep desire to learn to know him better is central to understanding who we are and what we're doing here. I want to read that again. Knowing God and developing a deep desire to learn to know him better is central to understanding who we are and what we're doing here. Like I said, we won't ever actually be able to know everything about who God is, but we can keep learning. And the very process, the activity of discovering or trying to discover who he is, molds us into the people of God. We become a people with understanding, a people with vision, a people with purpose, people dedicated to his work and to his kingdom. We are imitators of Christ. We are seekers of truth. We are the Bereans who seek diligently. We are obedient servants in this world. 
kingdom servants. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Let's kneel for prayer. Father, I thank you for allowing us to know you. I pray that we would continue to seek to know you more. Thank you for your desire for a relationship with us. And I pray that we could uh, continue to reciprocate that. Pray that we can continue to seek to know you more and more each day as we go through this journey. Pray that we would be obedient servants, building your kingdom with purpose and with vision. I thank you for each one here today, and I pray that as we go forth, we could listen to you, we could seek you more. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Kendall. I really appreciated the message. Um, Who is God? What does it mean to be a Christian? Are we Epicureans? Are we Stoics? Or are we the people in Berea?